Um, it's interesting. There was a meme, I believe, where uh, somebody said uh, in in the 1950s we imagined 2020 would be the year where we would be um, regularly flying back and forth from the moon uh, to to the Earth. We would have uh, a Hilton hotel on the moon. You know, you could book a flight to the moon and go away for a weekend. That's what they thought 2020 was going to be. Instead, 2020 is the year where we are teaching people how to wash their hands, and it's it is humorous when you think about it. And yet the Obsession with sanitizer, even in a nation like India, where quite frankly the uh, the obsession with sanitation is is is, is far less. Um, if you've lived in India, you know that many restaurants don't even have soap. Many bathrooms don't even have soap. Um, some bathrooms don't even have water. I remember going to uh, rural college in uh, December of last year as a speaker for a conference. Um, and I went into the bathroom in an area where it was kind of like dry season, so the water had run out. Um, there was no water in this bathroom, let alone soap. And you just make do with it. You know, you uh, find some other way to wash your hands. Uh, they have, you know, buckets of water on, on tap before meals and things like that. Um, but even in India, there's a craze now with sanitizing your hands after you've just been outside anywhere, any public place. Now you have to come home and immediately sanitize your hands. And that just tells you that even in a nation of the kind I just mentioned, if we are taking it this seriously, that's telling you something. Um, so what what do we make of the contradiction in the fact that the main sanitizer brand in India literally says immunity boosting, which is the ultimate contradiction. Sanitiz sanit uh, over sanitizing doesn't boost your immunity, it destroys it. Uh, this is why I knew people travel all over the world as Americans and got food poisoning in nations like Peru. A guy went to Peru and uh, was sick for like two, three days. A guy went to Vietnam, sick for two, three days. I got food poisoning in India when I first lived here as well. And it's precisely because uh, you are so weak to uh, several other people who have uh, mentioned uh, coronavirus now. Obviously in the United States, that is a bi really big story right now, the biggest story. It's actually um, uh, even gone past the election of 2020, the biggest story. Um, and it does deserve a serious response, although there's obviously wandering into very controversial territory talking about something as personal as this. Um, I get my news from daily newspaper, but the headline this morning was Vanessa Hudgens had tweeted, I guess, or maybe it was on Instagram, um, that uh, people are going to die. It's tragic, but it's inevitable. And now she has to issue an apology um, for stating what is an obvious fact. And Linkola's realization that we are living in the era of the antinomies of democracy, like Kant's antinomies in which we have to affirm a thesis and its antithesis at the same time, that's basically what we have now with the antinomies of democracy. Everybody's the same because the systems of moder modernity require this equalization, suspension of ecological context. Um, in which you're reduced to, um, in, in the case of communication, a speaker and nothing more than a speaker. In the case of Kantian ethics, uh, an ethical agent and nothing more than that. Um, and, and at the same time, we have this cult of the unique and unreplaceable individual, the unique and irreplaceable individual, for which even if you acknowledge the obvious scientific fact that people are going to die of coronavirus, you have to issue an apology to the world, basically, is what apparently has happened with Vanessa Hudgens. Um, it's a bizarre situation we're living in today. And of course, remarkably controversial. How would the single most controversial thinker on uh, these sort of topics react to it? That's a legitimate question. Um, Vanessa Hudgens ain't got shit on Linkola when it comes to controversy. So how, how would he feel about this? I actually got curious before doing this video. I looked up Twitter. Um, I don't have a Twitter account anymore, but I can still, you know, use the search engine um, to see what are people talking about with Linkola. And some people, one person said, you know, secretly somewhere in Finland, um, Linkola is doing, is dancing a jig right now out of celebration that finally there's going to be a natural check on global overpopulation. There's going to be a natural plague to, to kind of um, thin the herd a little bit. Um, somebody else said, if I recall correctly, how many of you wonder if... Linkola might have even played a role, something ridiculous. I mean, these are tweets, obviously, and Twitter is totally unregulated. Uh, but you could see that the the expectation, even by uh, anonymous, like, random Twitter trolls, is that Linkola would recognize coronavirus 
as not the maybe tragedy of, you know, like Vanessa Hudgens, some people are going to die, um, and we have to pretend that not a single one of them will. Um, rather, he would actually recognize it as being kind of like a forest fire, is how some people react. Now, we, what we can do um, is look back at the archives of how he has reacted to other catastrophes. And one of the things that makes him controversial, of course, is the fact that in uh, one interview in, I believe, 2011, they asked him about um, things like famines. And he said that uh, suspending the mind of man and adopting the mind of nature leads you to realize that many things which you're taking for granted as ethical actions today are actually the exact opposite. If a nation, for example, goes completely depletes its water reserves and faces um, death by thirst, you should not make radical leaps to transport water from across the globe to prevent them from dying of thirst. You should simply let them face the consequences of their own violation of ecological law. If a nation um, ruins its agricultural farmland with industrial practices and faces famine, you should not transport food by by enormous leaps across the globe to try to um, correct what is naturally happening. This is extremely controversial, but it is what he has said. There's one another about people uh, crossing border from, I don't know, some other nation that's facing famine to come into Finland to, to, to be fed. What, what should we do? His reaction is, um, why are we watching this on television in the first place? The interviewer said, well, you just watch these images on television and, uh, and not do anything. He said, well, why are we watching television in the first place? Yeah, you've already broken ecological law by, quite frankly, wasting your time watching the media anyway. So you can see that these are um, things which are far beyond Vanessa Hudgens acknowledging people are going to die in, in controversy. And that is one of the reasons why the media will never speak about Linkola except in sensationalist terms. How would he react to a situation which is, however, more complicated because of the questionable origins of the virus itself? So there was one video I did on Linkola and Zizek about how Zizek men mentioned all the way back back in 2008 that um, in our era, one subjective mistake could destroy the human race. One bio uh, agent could escape from a laboratory and cause human extinction. And somebody commented just this morning, well, that quote has aged particularly well, hasn't it? Because, you know, this very well might be that. And I, I remember looking at the, uh, the conspiracy theories back in, I don't know, early January, maybe it was, um, there were conspiracy theories that this was uh, a, a bio experiment which escaped from the lab. It's kind of coincidental that it was just 10 miles away from the only top security bio lab in China in which some people allege that there are, there's a covert bio warfare program in Wuhan. Bit of a coincidence. And some people are saying, you know, the blaming it on eating a bat in an illegal you know, wild game market is just a distraction to get people to not think about what's really going on here. There was even a conspiracy that the uh, the uh, the sequence for, for HIV was uh, was used to engineer this. I don't know if these things are true, and I am not promoting these as true, but I am saying that these are things which I had heard um, uh, put forth as hypotheses. So that, of course, complicates things significantly. Because now you're not talking about a natural catastrophe. Now you're talking about a technological catastrophe. And that's something completely different. Um, and even worse so, even if it is not something which was manufactured in a laboratory for nefarious purposes, which I remember, um, you know, when I was uh, living in a shady apartment in Denver with about seven roommates, about half of whom were drug addicts who were stealing money every week, one of these addicts was kicked out at gunpoint kind of interesting story from my life. And that night, because uh, he was he was caught stealing, so one of my roommates took a, literally took a gun and, and forced him out of the apartment at gunpoint. Um, I bought a baseball bat at Walmart just down the road that night at like two in the morning. I bought a baseball bat. And my roommate said, because we knew he was coming back again. And as I recall, he did come back and steal some stuff. Um, my roommate said, do you want it used on you? I said, beg your pardon. He said, do not bring a weapon into your house unless you could imagine being used on you. And this is arguably what happened if the story about China is true with China, because if they engineered this for another country, 
and found that they were the first country to get it. If this is true, it's kind of like that. This is the idea Kaczynski has that you shouldn't make these weapons in the first place because the very concept of having rational control over how it's used is an illusion. You can't actually control, you cannot predict how these are going to be used because if you engineer it only for ethical purposes, um, you'll find that there's an element of unpredictability hardwired into technology. And when you, when you started getting into complexity theory, um, the very notion of trying to determine where a complex system goes with all the difficulties of there is no single cause and effect relation. That's a metaphysical fiction. There are complicated feedback loops. The system grows um, exponentially uh, in, in complexity as it grows linearly in size. Um, you have to realize that's all or nothing. You just can't meddle technologically in the first place. So there, there's, there's that problem. Um, the technological one, but even if that were not the case, um, it would still be a technological problem because how on earth is it that a epidemic in China has reached all the way to South America and uh, the, the remote nations in Africa within a couple months, unless we live in a world in which rapid transport and global communications are taken for granted as a norm, and that simply is technology. Okay. Uh, being able to get on an airplane and uh, be anywhere within 24 hours uh, is technology. I know this from my own experience. It takes two days to go from uh, North America to India. Um, it would have taken, I don't know how long, you know, like a year if you had sailed the old fashioned way. I don't know how long it would take. It would be a while. Um, so this is a technological problem in addition to being a natural problem. So the idea that Linkola would say this is simply natural consequences of overstepping ecological law and the consequences of it must be respected. It's different when it's technological in origin, as we see this problem is. In that case, Linkola's response would likely be the technology itself has to go because he would argue likely that this is just another example of how the technology is itself um, bringing about human destruction. Uh, it's not a bug to the system. It is a natural consequence of allowing this to happen. And in that case, Linkola has mentioned things that are, are quite similar to Kaczynski with regard to the machines. You have to destroy them. You said multiple times, if you have the green police state, you have to destroy the machines. He mentioned in one quote, we're all out of touch with reality. The first thing a person would do if he or she was brought back to reality out of the, you know, the, the hallucination, the collective dream that we're all living in, the first thing that person would do is they destroy the machines. Because that, was, that would be the first thing. If you could see the birthmark, if you're given the sunglasses, the first thing you do is destroy the machines. And he's specifically talking about the artificially intelligent ones. Okay, so that's what complicates the situation. It's not simply a natural problem, it's a technological problem. So let me go ahead and get to some of these comments. Damon says, just commented, perfect timing. Yes, I saw the comment and I decided it deserved a, a video because it's, um, of course, uh, something which um, is, is relevant not only maybe to the video you commented, but maybe relevant to, uh, to deserve a video for, for uh, just to put out on the, um, um, uh, put out onto the internet uh, as a whole right now. So um, uh, Ahmed says, guess what? Petroplastic civilization has brought us to the virus lives most longer on plastic surfaces like mobile phones up to 30 days, long live plastics. I remember uh, being a truck stop janitor and finding uh, cell phones all over toilet paper dispensers in bathroom stalls and public bathrooms. And, uh, you know, somebody would come back like a couple minutes later, like, you know, freaking out. Like it used to be if you lost your wallet, you'd freak out. Now you lose your cell phone, you leave it in the bathroom stall and they'll be so thankful you get back. And it's like, well, what was this doing out in the most unsanitary place? possible anyway a public truck stop bathroom on the toilet paper dispenser unless you were watching youtube while apparently taking a dump in a public bathroom that's how addicted people are they're they're literally watching youtube in, in filthy places they cannot even keep it in their pocket for a couple minutes okay um and you keep in mind that if that's the case the uh if, if cell phones are basically a carrier for the disease then we're screwed because those are the, the these are the most germy uh, and, uh, and, uh, and disease prone uh, surfaces precisely because we can't 
not have them. So Damien says, if you could uh, please uh, mention the contradictions inherent with the obsession with uh, sanitation in the wake of this crisis and the possibility of opening the doors for a longer, larger pandemic. Okay, thank you for mentioning that. Um, it's interesting, there was a meme, I believe, where uh, somebody said uh, in, in the 1950s, we imagined 2020 would be the year where we would be um, regularly flying back and forth from the moon uh, to, to the earth. We would have uh, a Hilton hotel on the moon. You know, you could book a flight to the moon and go away for a weekend. That's what they thought 2020 was going to be. Instead, 2020 is the year where we are teaching people how to wash their hands. And it's, it is humorous when you think about it. And yet the obsession with sanitizer, even in a nation like India, where quite frankly, the, uh, the obsession with sanitation is, 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 is far less. Um, if you've lived in India, you know that many restaurants don't even have soap. Many bathrooms don't even have soap. Um, some bathrooms don't even have water. I remember going to uh, rural college in uh, December of last year as a speaker for a conference. Um, and I went into the bathroom in an area where it was kind of like dry season. So the water had run out. Um, there was no water in this bathroom, let alone soap. And you just make do with it. You know, you uh, find some other way to wash your hands. Uh, they have, you know, buckets of water on, on tap before meals and things like that. Um, but even in India... There's a craze now with sanitizing your hands after you've just been outside anywhere, any public place. Now you have to come home and immediately sanitize your hands. And that just tells you that even in a nation of the kind I just mentioned, if we are taking it this seriously, that's telling you something. Um, so what, what do we make of the contradiction in the fact that the main sanitizer brand in India literally says immunity boosting, which is the ultimate contradiction. Sanit uh, over sanitizing doesn't boost your immunity, it destroys it. Uh, this is why I knew people travel all over the world as Americans and got food poisoning in nations like Peru. A guy went to Peru and uh, was sick for like two, three days. A guy went to Vietnam, sick for two, three days. I got food poisoning in India when I first lived here as well. And it's precisely because uh, you are so weak. The food, we, we often think as Westerners, like, oh, the food is contaminated in, in third world. No, it's your immune system is so weak. You can't even um, eat off of a plate that's been rinsed with tap water without getting ill in some of these places. And is it going to make it better if we over sanitize even more at a time when people are already vulnerable? And the answer to that is probably no. Um, and the... Um, the calls to regulate more is what this really boils down to is I got an email, a very thoughtful email from a friend about how this is simply going to lead to more regulation and ironically more technology. It's a problem caused by technology. It's going to lead to more technology because now they have to regulate on the microscopic level. Um, because if Tom Hanks and the first lady of Spain and the first lady of Canada and um, all of these other, there's like celebrities in Finland or someplace who are getting coronavirus. If they're getting it at this point, um, it's gone beyond even the uh, Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe. Great story. I'd recommend you to reread if you haven't, um, or if it's been a while since you've read it, reread that now. It's about a prince in the era of the Red Death, the Red Plague, basically medieval era, who decides to flee the city and go to an isolated castle in the countryside with his fellow elites and just basically party while everybody else dies. What he does not think about is whether the walls are strong enough to keep out the Red Death. And it shows up as a person. But the thing we, we think about now with coronavirus is it's microscopic. And this just shows that the system has walls with, with gaps big enough that Something this microscopic thing can get get through those holes, and no matter how many nested layers deeper you go in, it'll show up. And I'm not wishing poor on anybody, but I am saying at this point, Joe Biden, are you telling me he can't fall ill on the campaign trail at nearly 80 years old? Are you saying that can't happen? Are you saying that uh, uh, you know any presidential candidate, any world leader around the world, especially the elderly, are you are you telling me that they can't have this happen when clearly? It has uh, is something which the current barriers that we have within the system are not sufficient to control. So what will happen, I was told, 
is inevitably, even though they, they won't be able to control it, they'll double down on efforts to do so, and you will have an even more regulated society. The technological system in the West, as much as it already controls people, will uh, double down and control them even more, because now it is a matter of controlling on the microscopic level. The question is, where will this lead? They're, so they're basically going to accelerate the technological system in order to counter a, a problem which is basically impossible for them. It's, an, it's a challenge they can't meet. And it reminds me of Fermi's paradox in reverse image, uh, it's basically the inverse image of Fermi's paradox. Kaczynski says in uh, Anti-Tech Revolution Chapter 2 that uh, the solution to Fermi's paradox is that there's an ideal point on uh, technological development where you can do intergalactic space travel. It's far beyond us um, and, and any other alien civilization for that matter because it's never been done. The problem is it's a certain point along the uh, trajectory, but self-destruction is before it. So you can't refute Fermi's paradox without self-destructing first. And the question I have is maybe traversing enormous distances in space is kind of like the challenge of trying to control the entire global population on a microscopic level. It's not the problem of too big, but of too small. But is it the same problem? Is it also beyond the point of self-destruction in which you'll never actually reach this point because it's, it's an impossible object? Um, but the, even though you can't do it, you'll still double down on the efforts to do it. And in the meantime, you'll just get more control. So it's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to it. It's something which just has to be thought about. But I'll see if there's uh, uh, some other uh, comments real quick. Uh, Ahmed says, question of food supply, starving nations. Daniel Quinn called on this as amping up the carrying capacity to save starving Africa to later introduce Coca-Cola colonialism. So. The idea that the only reason we save people is so that they can be consumers. If you're not going to be a consumer, nobody's going to save you. That makes sense. And in, in America, um, the, the benefits are only for the consumers. Okay. Uh, if you're not going to consume, um, you're not going to get any benefits. And it's not a coincidence that people who actually try to live completely off the system get, get busted. The health inspectors will bust you. You don't have the option of being self-sufficient in the cabin in the woods. They will bust you. The health inspectors will. You're not allowed to collect that rainwater. You're not allowed to slaughter a chicken outdoors now. That's to the point of absurdity where um, a chicken that lives for 42 days covered in chicken feces and never taking a step um, and then slaughtered in a facility in mass with all kinds of other sick birds that will give you food poisoning if it's slightly undercooked. That's sanitary, according to the FDA. Uh, whereas uh, raising a chicken at home and slaughtering it outdoors at your own, in your own backyard without a license, that's what's unsanitary. That's how backwards things are. But of course, this is the world we're living in, um, in which somebody outside the system uh, will have no, no benefits at all. Um, he also argues, says Ahmed, that nations with food surplus should not help others. They should stop playing God and let the carrying capacity handle the population. Um, nations with food surplus should not help others. Yeah, there's something to that. Um, and there's also, it's not only the food, it's the, it's the energy. So you have ridiculous links, like um, um, Linkle was talking about, they were literally melting like Arctic ice and transporting it across the globe to give water to people without even thinking about the energy cost, not, not only to transfer the ice, but also to melt it. And the, the return on investment seems to make sense be only because we have the originary surplus, which is fossil fuels. Without that surplus, none of these other surpluses are possible. And of course, the era of surplus is ending as we speak. Damon says, I may have misunderstood you, but did you say self-destruction might be ecologically impossible at this point? No, I said that the accomplishment which lies further along the trajectory than self-destruction is impossible. So the technological society which can uh, do intergalactic space travel is impossible because it would have already self-destructed before then. So self-destruction is um, I, I, not at all an impossible object. That's the possible object. That's what you actually get before you reach the chimera or the mirage in the desert. It's like the great Moyalam novel, Goat Gaze, about a, uh, a Moyali migrant laborer who goes to Saudi Arabia. Very common thing in this part of the world, by the way. He goes to Saudi Arabia on a work visa and he gets taken to an illegal um, work camp out in the desert. And he, uh, he and another guy from Sudan 
um, they try to escape. And they're walking through the desert for miles and miles and miles. And then one of the, uh, the escaping slaves, uh, he, he starts eating, go- he starts gobbling up, up uh, mouthfuls of sand. He thinks that something has materialized. And that's basically what an ecologically impossible object is. It's the mirage, which you think is there, but you're actually just gobbling up, you know, the ability to self-destruct in the process. That's basically what we're doing collectively. Uh, the mirage, it, what you think is there, the feast, it's not really there. You're just investing work to uh, bring about your own destruction at that point. So what else would Linkola say about this? So once again, there's a difference between him acknowledging that nat- natural catastrophes like forest fires must be allowed to happen, but he has the exact opposite view of technological disasters. Those must be prevented. We must seize the power to stop technological disasters. So Linkola does not accept this idea of, well, you know, um, um, robots completely replacing humans is inevitable in the same way that depleting your water if you're irresponsible with it, like Cape Town, South Africa, or Las Vegas, Nevada, that's inevitable because of ecological law. No, he says the exact opposite. This is meddling on a technological level, and you have to forcibly stop it in order to bring back a normal functioning of ecological law. So I've been talking for about 25 minutes. I think I will go ahead and um, um, say goodbye now. One last call for comments. And otherwise, I enjoyed this discussion. Thank you guys for participating. And uh, thank you.